Hello and welcome to today's webinar, How to Communicate with Students in Ways that Work, sponsored by Kindle Hunt Publishing. There are many controversial and misinformed content on the website um, that's impacting political views, professional relationships, and even family lives. Our expert presenter today will demonstrate how you can use sound principles of constructive dialogue to help students participate actively in conversations, cultivating the experience of inclusion in university settings. With a student-centered framework as a foundation, this training session illustrates how faculty members such as you can encourage interpersonal conversations with diverse students and thereby promote active dialogue, interactive exchanges in the university classroom. Today's presenter, Dr. Jose Rodriguez, fuses a lecture type webinar with an interactive small group session, giving you a hands-on opportunity for dialogue and collaborative engagement amongst yourselves. To participate, please use the Q&A or chat functions within the Zoom platform. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Dr. Jose Rodriguez. Hi, Jose, how are you? Hi, Ryan, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And thank all of you that joined us on this uh, webinar. We really appreciate your uh, participation. And so let's, let's get started. I wanna just share an author's note here at the beginning. An earlier version of this adapted content was published in Interpersonal Communication for Contemporary Living, focusing on useful strategies for managing relationships at work, at home, and at play. There's also another acknowledgement that the material was supported in part by the National Institute of General Medical Sciences of the National Institutes of Health under a variety of awards. So with that in mind, uh, some introductions, we just wanna get a sense of what brings you to this workshop, why this particular training and how can we support you? So if you just wanna take maybe 30 seconds or so to type in some answers to these questions on the chat function, I'm sure that Ryan will be able to share those with me. So feel free, share some of your responses to why you're here, why this particular training, let us know on the chat function. Uh, we have a graduate instructor at the college level and they'd like to know how to engage students better. Um, All right. A media about, ethics instructor and gender and race instructor in the media. Um, and they would like to increase student discussion within their classroom. Okay. And maybe one more. Um, students are sometimes too belligerent and they'd like to prepare them for communication without aggression and to manage aggressive communication. Uh, I hear that a lot. Um, I don't know if, if you've struggled with that as well, Jose, but um, that that's more common than we'd like to talk about. Exactly, 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 exactly. So awesome. Those are all great reasons uh, to come to a webinar such as this. And I just wanted to get a sense of some of the motivation or intention beside, behind um, you know, your participation. So with that in mind, let's create some common ground. Here we go. And if Ryan, if you would help us by reading this quote from the letter from Birmingham jail, that would be great. Absolutely. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Right, and this famous quote by Martin Luther King Jr., letter of Birmingham jail, speaks to some of the issues that we saw, that we just heard about in that uh, sharing that Ryan did about you know, your comments from, from the chat, right? This idea of preparing students for at times a hostile world and also preparing ourselves for communicating in ways that work. And if you notice in this quote, I highlight the word bad and highlight the word good for a reason, because I wanna make a distinction here. Are, are you a good person or are you a bad person, right? This good versus bad. And I'm sure here I'm preaching to the choir. So most of us are probably saying, well, heck, I'm a good person. What are you talking about, right? <laughs> So I, I joke about that because it's an important distinction that um, 
Dolly Chung articulates and elaborates on in her book, 2018, this idea of good versus bad people and adopting a growth mindset. Because the bottom line is if we consider ourselves good people, sometimes that prevents us from improving, right? If we say, oh, I'm a good person, I don't need this stuff, or I'm already all set, or I'm, I'm not racist, or I'm not bad, so I don't need to do anything else. And it creates this kind of almost fixed mindset that can be problematic because the bottom line is we are persons in progress. We are persons in process. And that idea of a growth mindset or being a person in process allows us to say, hey, you know, I'm not perfect. I can learn something. And that's why I'm here. That's why we're all here. With this idea in mind, I think it, we create a space of safety and a, and a space of um, caring for our students, letting them know, hey, I'm a person just like you. Sometimes I mess up. But, you know, if we get stuck into that identity of I'm a good person because I know this stuff, we sometimes fall prey to this dilemma of knowing. And sometimes students can perceive that as being overly arrogant or cocky or judgmental. And so I want to challenge this idea of knowing because one of the things that we're finding out through lots of research in social psychology is that knowing is not enough. And it's actually called the GI Joe fallacy. And I actually created a, a link here to a YouTube page that has a cute little presentation about the GI Joe fallacy that you can see at another time. We've tried kind of sharing it uh, here live, but sometimes there are bandwidth issues where it doesn't show up well on your screen or whatever. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to let you know about it and then describe it. This goes back to that cheesy 80s cartoon, uh, the GI Joe uh, cartoon. And at the end of that particular segment or at the end of the GI Joe cartoon, there would always be this public service announcement with this cheesy, well, now you know, and knowing is half the battle. And what we're noticing in social psychology is that knowing is not half the battle. Knowing is not enough. You may know that you need to exercise, but you don't. You may know that you probably should stay away from certain foods, but you don't. You may know that uh, you know getting vaccinated is a good thing, but you don't. The list goes on and on and on and on. And we see all kinds of examples of that process in our society. So knowing is not enough. So what is the answer instead of knowing? Well, we're knowing uh, two things are actually very important. One is habits. And the second one is emotional regulation, creating habits, creating structures that work for us, and also regulating emotion when we get triggered, having a moment of pause, reflect and choose. We sometimes call that mindfulness. When we get triggered, having a moment of pause, right? Reflecting on what we wanna do and then choosing a course of action that is most helpful, useful, and kind. So with these ideas in mind, I want to elaborate on this idea of a fixed type, right? I'm a particular type of person, like I'm a good person. And this is what I call the fixed type, the idea that we consider ourselves to have a, a fixed identity. I also call this the Popeye fallacy. If you remember that classic line from the Popeye cartoon, I am what I am, and that's all that I am. And I interpret this to mean that Popeye is identifying as a fixed self or a person with a fixed identity. And again, considering the theme that we've been talking about, this idea of a fixed identity can be very problematic because we think of ourselves, for example, as a good person who doesn't need to change. And then we become the very problem that we're attempting to address in our classrooms, right? So a better working metaphor to kind of get us away from a fixed identity into a more fluid identity is to think of ourselves uh, in a unique way. And I'm gonna share a metaphor with you of uh, a game of chess, all right? And I'm talking about a physical board. Think of a, a physical board 
with chess pieces on top of it, okay? Have that in your mind. Now, if I ask most people during a live seminar, especially, hey, what do you identify with on this chess board? Most people say, oh, the rook or the king or the queen. And most people identify with a particular piece. And in my mind, this represents our tendency to think of ourselves as a fixed identity, as a fixed piece. I challenge you or I invite you to think about yourself very differently and think about yourself as the board where the activity is taking place, as the board where the action is taking place, the actual chess board where the pieces are moving and where the dynamic is occurring. That's probably a better metaphor for seeing ourselves as persons in progress and persons in process, right? Process and progress, process being our sense of being and progress being our sense of becoming the person that we're uh, becoming in communion with our students, especially in the classroom, right? And when we have that, that fluid mindset, we're much more likely to say to our students, hey, listen, I'm a person, I messed up, I'm sorry, I apologize. Hey, let's move forward. How can I be better? How can I support you? How can I be in a space of compassion with you? So that's what I wanna talk about here next, moving from a fixed identity to a fluid identity through conversation and really cultivating a path of compassion by facilitating empathy. And with those ideas in mind, what we're really looking to hear is ethical considerations. And I wanna to turn to the work of Mary Ann Warren, and she created this idea of moral status, which is treating other people with consideration by giving importance to what they need, what they prefer, or what would enhance their well being. And in her classic book, Moral Status Obligations to Persons and Other Living Things, she makes a case for two kind of chronic situations the case of racists and the case of sexists, right? So, in the case of racists, racists don't grant moral status to persons of a particular race, usually persons of color. In the case of sexists, sexists, usually men, don't grant moral status to women because sexist men tend to see women as inferior, okay? So this is uh, the trap of the fixed identity. And clearly a racist has a very fixed identity and a sexist has a very fixed identity showing the danger of that fixed identity. So let's look at how this arises in communication, right? The what and the how the message content and behavior. So, cause we can talk about philosophy we can talk about general ideas, but I wanna narrow down to the nitty gritty to talk about how this works and how we can structure conversations. One, I wanna talk about the what. And here we're talking about ethical content or messages in conversation that consider the other person by expressing authentic concern in a manner that shows positive regard with the intent of allevi alleviating or preventing uh, suffering, basically. So we're talking about what you say or the words that you use, uh, technically the denotative or the literal code in your expression. And that's the what, okay? The words that you use, the content in your message. The second idea is equally important. And this is what I call ethical behavior, which is the how, right? How many of us have heard over the years, it wasn't what you said, it was how you said it, boom. So here it is. This is the performance or the behavior engaging in other oriented moral behavior emanating from an ongoing perception of visceral concern for the welfare of another person with the intent of preventing or alleviating suffering. And here we're talking about how you act. Here we're talking about how you behave. Here we're talking about the way you deliver your message. And again, technically looking at the connotative suggested or implied meaning in your action. So we have the what, which is the content and the how, which is the behavior or the performance. 
with these two features in mind, we get a sense of what empathy starts to look like conceptually. And in a moment, we're gonna talk about how that shows up in our actual words. All right, so Emmy, I'm gonna ask you to share your wonderful voice here by reading this quote from James Baldwin. Would you help us please? Absolutely. I'm terrified at the moral apathy, the death of the heart, which is happening in my country. These people have deluded themselves for so long that they really don't think I'm human. I base this on their conduct, not on what they say. And this means that they have become in themselves moral monsters. Beautiful, thank you. And I love this quote because James Baldwin makes this distinction that we've been talking about. He says, you know, these people have deluded themselves for so long that they really don't think I'm human. I base this on their conduct, not on what they say. So he's making this wonderful distinction between what we say and what we do, the what and the how, indicating how important those two features of our behavior really are, how important those features are in terms of developing a culture of inclusion, a culture of compassion, a culture of understanding, especially in the university classroom. So here's the dilemma. What happens when we forget about the what and the how? What happens when we forget to say the right thing or the compassionate thing or the empathic thing? And what happens when we engage in messages that perhaps are sarcastic or rude or off-center or insensitive. There are definitely consequences. So I wanna share a bit of humor here. And that's why we lift on three, communication. What happens when we forget about the what and the how? Well, we drop the ball in this comic uh, cartoon. We, we drop the patient, we, we drop the ball, we drop the class, we drop the student, we drop the lecture, we drop that connection that our students are looking for, that empathy, that connection, that, that space of safety. So I want you to share your examples here. You, you're getting the idea of the what and the how. Can you take a moment in the chat function and Ryan will help me out by reading some of those, take a couple of seconds here to type, hmm, what happens when you forget about the how and the what? What has happened in class or on email or online? Maybe you said the wrong thing or maybe um, you were too quick to send out that email or maybe students were uh, very agitated and you didn't quite know how to respond, but what happens when you've noticed in your own lived experience that you forget about the how, the words that you use, or you forget about your behavior. What happens in class, on email, or online when those ruptures in human behavior occur? So again, let's take a brief, maybe 10 seconds or so, type in a couple of responses on the chat function and then Ryan will share some of those with me. Go for it. Uh, someone mentioned student morale decreases. Exactly. Student morale goes in the tank, absolutely. Um, a student may shut down and never speak up in class again. Students completely shut down, yep. Uh, damage relationships with students. Uh, loss of credibility as an instructor. Absolutely, loss of credibility, um, loss of connection with students. Those are all great examples. You get the picture, right? Very important stuff. So you might be saying at this point, all right, Dr. Rodriguez, but you know what? This sounds like too much empathy, too much caring. I don't know if I can do this stuff. So we're gonna, for a moment, talk about compassion and equanimity. And I'm gonna ask uh, Ryan to help me with this one because there's a question of balance, right? There's only so much that we can do. There's only so much that we can uh, accomplish because we're just one person. 
So yes, we can take responsibility, but there's also this delicate balance of compassion and equanimity. So I love this quote and I'm gonna have Ryan help us with this, please. In order to meet suffering in an open yet truly sustainable way for the long haul, we need to stop trying to control it. Otherwise we are sure to succumb to empathy fatigue. Whether you care for a classroom of young children with special needs, an aging parent, a difficult to understand teenager, or a community with no clear resolution to their problems in sight, any skillful caregiving relationship relies on balance. The balance between opening one's heart as much as possible and accepting the limits of what one can do. The balance between compassion and equanimity. Wonderful. Uh, Sharon Salzberg um, shared this uh, brilliant distinction in her work, Real Happiness at Work. And I share that because, you know, I, I've done a version of this workshop live uh, with faculty, kind of a three hour session. And every once in a while, someone will say, oh my gosh, but I try with students and sometimes it's too much. And I put that in there because, hey, we have to acknowledge at times there's only so much that we can do and we have to find what that delicate balance is for each of us from a place of integrity, from a place of genuine um, solidarity, right? So what becomes important is our intention, a question of intention, purses, uh, sorry, purpose and results. And one of the things to keep in mind is sometimes we have very good intentions, but the good intentions perpetuate a system of inequity with no malice, but yet full effect. So we need to be strategic in our communication. And that's what I wanna talk about here in the last uh, few minutes that we have together, the way that we invite the way that we uh, minimize problems and try to cultivate intentions that work in our classroom is to invite dialogue and have a focus on conversation. But the question becomes, how do you do that, right? What, what, what are the systems? What are the structures? And that's the heart of what I wanted to talk about today. And why dialogue? Well, here are some reasons why dialogue. So Emmy, I'm gonna share these and I'd like for you to please give us your wonderful rendition of each of these. So here we go, why dialogue? Go ahead. Only dialogue, which requires critical thinking is also capable of generating critical thinking. Without dialogue, there's no communication and without communication, there can be no true education. And the next one? The notion of shared meaning and the absence of a pre-established purpose or agenda. The primary human reality is persons in conversation. All right. Conversation flows on, the application and interpretation of words, and only in its course do words have their meaning. Conversation, understood widely enough, is the form of human transactions in general. All right, and I think this is the last one. If we see knowing not as having an essence to be described by scientists or philosophers, but rather as a right by current standards to believe, then we are well on the way to seeing conversation as the ultimate context within which knowledge is to be understood. Wonderful, thank you so much. I really like that last one in particular because conversation is creating a context in which knowledge is to be understood. It is literally the fabric of knowledge in our classrooms and that's why dialogue is so important. So uh, what's the message? Why, what are we doing? We're trying to call people in and inviting them to belong. We're trying to send a message of, I create a space of safety so that we can have a conversation. I cultivate a culture of inclusion so that you can talk to me. You know that you can say what you need to say because I care about you. So this is the message that we're trying to say. This is the message that we're attempting to convey in our classroom. And I wanna share with you a structure for doing that. Over the last 30 years or so, we have discovered, and you, this is probably not news to you, but you've seen some version of this in the past. And yet it's important to re realize that this basic structure is a thing to remember to kind of keep in your back pocket. And it has three features. One is perspective taking. The second one is called empathic concern. And the third is what I call comforting or uh, solidarity. 
And perspective taking is essentially a statement of basic understanding. And some examples are, I get what you're saying, I hear you, yeah, I see. Second, empathic concern is a message of caring for the other person. That sounds terrible, I'm sorry, I'm concerned about you. Those are all examples. And lastly, there are comforting messages or comforting behavior, which is a move to action that supports the other person. And these might be in the form of a very simple question, like, what can I do to support you? Or how can I help? Uh, what can I do that might be helpful or that might be useful? Those are all comforting type messages. So with these three features in mind, I wanna give you some very concrete examples. This might happen in the classroom, right? Sometimes uh, a student might share something very intimate in their dialogue in class and they might talk about their grandfather passing away or de dealing with the COVID crisis or whatever. And you can respond by saying, wow, I get it. That sounds um, you know, really heart-wrenching let us know how we can support you. Thank you for your courage in sharing your story. That's a very simple way of not only acknowledging the student's truth, but also inviting other students to share their stories in the future, okay? So if, if we were live, I would share um, some videos with a variety of different interactions with students to kind of show you how this works. But in this mediated forum with limited time, I wanna share some email messages to give you a sense of how this might work in that context. So sample one is an initial email message that I'm sure you've gotten a gazillion times in class, right? I'm in your class, will you drop me? Or my personal example, did I miss anything? <laughs> and how do you respond, right? It's very easy to get frustrated. It's very easy to get triggered. Here's one response that I've cultivated over the years, dear student, Thank you for your email message. I understand the dilemma that you're describing. I get what you're saying. Notice that first and second sentence are basically a statement of understanding. Then I go back. Please know that I will not drop you because you missed the first day of class. I respectfully request, however, that you get notes and other relevant details about the course from a friend or a classmate. I hope that you find this message helpful please let me know how I can support you further. Now, explicitly or implicitly, you see those three features of perspective taking, empathy, and some statement of support, okay? Here's another, here's another message. This student was having a, a challenge um, with his grandfather who he, take, he took care of. And he says, dear professor, I completely understand. I've apologized to my groups uh, because I was absent. I also wanna to apologize to you. I'm still dealing with some family issues and I need to take care of my grandfather during the day. Anyways, I want to apologize. See you on Tuesday. That was his original message. And I responded by saying, thank you for your respectful reply. I'm so sorry to hear about the situation from your grandfather. By the way, that's a statement of empathy. He's lucky to have you in his life. You have my deepest empathy and that's an actual explicit message of empathy. Please let me know how I can support you. Again, you see that pattern of perspective taking, empathic concern, and some message of comforting or solidarity, okay? All right, so now it's your turn, all right? Now that you've seen the pattern, so how might you use this content or how have you used this content in class, on email, or online? And again, you can share via the chat function and I'll give you the possible uh, structure here. So take a moment, tell us how might you use this in class, online or even via email to allow students to feel included and facilitate moments of dialogue in your class. Thank you, Jose. Um, while, while people are writing down their examples or scenarios, I have one that came in earlier and I thought it'd be a great way to, to kickstart this. Perfect. Um, a student doesn't have their assignment to, completed to discuss in class. Obviously the instructor is frustrated. How do they communicate to the student in order to proceed? 
All right, good, good. So again, using this system, and again, this happens all the time in my class, I'm sure in yours, you know, every semester there's one or two students, especially now in the midst of uh, this COVID situation that we're all dealing with. And typically we can say, hey, listen, I, I understand that you're not ready, you know, um, we are all under a lot of stress, especially in the last 18 months. Um, is there any way that that we can that we can support you, right? And the student, when you do that, will usually say, "Hey, can I talk to you after class?" Or, "Yeah, you know, it would be nice if I could maybe have an extra day or present it in the next um, class meeting or next week." Um, sometimes you, you can just say that, or you can meet with the student privately. I sometimes like to meet with the student privately because they're embarrassed usually in public and I don't want to get into any emotional content with them about what's going on in their lives. So usually I say, hey, listen, why don't we hit the pause button? I hear what you're saying. It's been a very difficult time for all of us. Why don't we talk after class? Does that sound fair? And the student usually says, yeah, that sounds fair. And then after class, I'll have a conversation with a student and say, hey, what's going on? Tell me about the situation. And they'll usually tell me about some hardship that they're having with their family, with their work, with their financial status. And I will just use this model and say, hey, I hear what you're saying. I'm so sorry that this is happening. That just sounds really um, awful. I admire you for your courage. What can I do to support you? How can I help? And then again, the student usually says, I'd like an extra day or I'd like an extra class or I'd like the ability to make it up. Would that be possible? And usually I say, yeah, it's no problem. Why don't we do it the next class period? Okay, so that's one way to deal with it. All right, are, are there any other comments coming up uh, in the chat function, Ryan? Yeah, yeah, there are. Um, here's one right here. Um, I'm just trying to process it here as, as I'm reading it. So okay. uh, give me a second and please keep them coming. Um, I have another scenario if you'd like um, that we can go off of. How, how do we um, handle students that we're teaching online and they're hiding behind the video? They have their video off, not engaged in class. How do we handle that scenario? All right, good, good. So very similar, very similar uh, approach. I, I try to manage this these conversations privately. So I might tell the student, I might say, hey, listen, uh, Bob or Mary or Joe, in the private chat function, because obviously you can use the, the chat function privately. Hey, could I see you after class? Do you mind staying after our Zoom session is over to have a conversation? And they usually say, oh yeah, I'll hang out afterwards. So I wait till all the students are gone and I'll have a conversation with the student and say, Hey, what's going on? I saw that you had your video off or your background is um, you know, changing all the time or you're not participating. I'm just kind of curious, is there anything going on that I need to know of? And they usually tell me again, some challenge that's happening in their life with their family, with their financial situation or with something related to the pandemic. And then I'll respond by saying, hey, I get it. I hear what you're saying. It's been very difficult for all of us. Um, how can I support you? You know, Because we want to hear your voice. We would like to hear you participate. We would like to have you be a part of the class. And they'll say, well, maybe I can use the chat function or maybe I can um, you know, remove my, uh, you know, myself from the video chat and then bring it, bring it back because my internet connection isn't stable. And I go, okay, let's try that next week. Does that sound fair? And we usually go from there, okay? But notice I'm using this pattern of, I understand what's happening. You know, I'm so sorry that's, that's occurring and try to find a way to support the student to, to include them and to make them a part of the class. All right, maybe one more. Sure, sure. This is a really good example. This, this I think, really summarizes what you've taught today, is this instructor uses inclusive language, such as we and us, when developing solutions with students. 
this makes them feel less alone in the process of getting back on track. Even though the instructor is not doing the homework, uh, they will say, we can get through this assignment together. This gives students a sense of relief as they try to get things done during a tough time. Perfect. I love it. We and us, hey, we can work through this. We can um, uh, find ways to resolve this issue. We can have a conversation about this. We can work this out. Hey, listen, what do you, what do you, what do you think about us having a conversation of, after class? We can make a plan. Wonderful. So having an inclusive use of we and us allows the student, you know, rhetorically to feel included in the conversation, to feel a part of the solution and move forward in a way that works. All right, wonderful. In the interest of time, I'm just gonna move forward here with some final thoughts, which is basically a call to action. And I remind you of that wonderful quote by James Baldwin, you know, uh, you are part of the problem. What do you choose to do? And at first, when you read that, it might serve as a trigger, but it isn't because if we are part of the problem, we are also part of the solution. And that's the thing to remember. We are part of the solution. We are part of the solution. We are part of the solution by creating uh, a structure in our classrooms of empathy, by using inclusive language, by encouraging students to participate, by letting them know that we care. And so I wanna end this webinar by thanking you. Uh, once again, I wanna thank you for all that you have done in the past, especially in this very difficult year. I wanna thank you for all that you're doing currently. And I wanna thank you for all that you will do in the future. Your students thank you, your community thanks you, and we thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thanks so much, Dr. Jose. Uh, thank you for joining us today as well. Um, in the coming days, you'll receive a link to the recording of this webinar and a complimentary handout that Jose has put together with three valuable concepts and examples to communicate with students in ways that work. Um, in the future, I encourage you to visit kendallhunt.com forward slash events to reserve your seat for future webinars like these. Thanks so much for joining us and I hope you have a good rest of the week.